One of the biggest misconceptions about creativity is that it takes a brilliant idea to solve a complex problem. While this may be true in pure sciences in most commercial contexts or even in day-to-day -day living, it is never that one silver bullet that does the magic. It is in fact a series of seemingly simple ideas that counts. The key is to have enough ideas that solve specific parts of the overall problem and then the thorny task looks very much tenable. Since creativity comes from combining concepts in an unusual fashion, and since it is exceedingly difficult to trace the origins of ideas, you are better off generating as many ideas as possible with the hope that some of them would click. That is what great scientists and artists do. As the author Walter Isaacson notes, the sparks come from ideas rubbing against each other rather than as bolts out of the blue. Sometimes it is hard to know the right thing to do for the planet. What sounds good may not necessarily be so. Rooftop solar panels, for example, are one of the most expensive and least effective ways to help the environment. Buying local food can actually increase water pollution and waste. According to research from the Danish and UK governments, plastic grocery bags may actually be better than cotton bags for the climate and for water. You may disagree with all or some of those claims and you may be right, it depends on your individual circumstances. If you live in Phoenix, Arizona for example, solar panels could be a smart choice. Using your own cotton bags continuously and without exception for shopping for several years is probably better for the environment than the alternatives. Each of these choices depends on personal circumstances and behavior. The best solutions for the environment are personal. Consider people with disabilities. Often they are judged using criteria of competence that are biased in favor of non-disabled people. Compare for example an average blind person with an average sighted person. Who will be more competent in walking from one place to another? You might think that the sighted person will be more competent because the sighted person can see where he or she is going, but this is using an unfair criterion. If you think about competence based on the fairer criterion of who can best walk with the eyes closed, then the blind person will definitely be more competent. Such knowledge about people who are blind and by extension other socially marginalized people can make us appreciate them and celebrate their unique abilities as they really are, rather than discriminate against, pity, or patronize them for some incompetence that does not exist except as a figment of our traditional, prejudiced imaginations. When you think, you are using your imagination to create an image or picture in your mind of an event rather than the real thing. If you are driving home from a football match, reviewing the game in your mind, you are merely imagining what the game was like. The game is no longer real. It's now only in your mind, in your memory. It was real once, but not any longer. Similarly, if you are thinking about how bad your marriage is, you are considering it in your mind. It's all in your imagination. You are literally making up your relationship. The thoughts you are having about your relationship are just thoughts. This is why the old saying, things aren't as bad as they seem, is almost always true. The reason things seem so bad is because your mind is able to recreate past events and preview upcoming events, almost as though they were happening right in front of you, at that moment, even though they're not. To make matters worse, your mind can add additional drama to any event, thereby making that event seem even worse than it really is, or was, or will be. Most people don't equate silence with appreciation. People whose work is always good still need to hear it from you occasionally. Let them know you've noticed they are meeting their goals. Acknowledgement and appreciation create a supportive work environment and keep motivation alive. Make your appreciation specific and positive by noting what was done well and why it matters. This makes people feel good and it also ensures that the behavior you identify is repeated. So don't just say, that was great. Say, that was great because both teams and individuals need positive, specific information about their accomplishments. Use your imagination. Post graphs showing what the team has achieved. Mark the achievement of major milestones or goals by bringing in sandwiches for lunch for everyone to share or putting up balloons. Send thank you notes. When you ignore success, people think it doesn't matter and stop trying. The quality of news is difficult to measure because there are no agreed upon standards that satisfy everyone's definition of high quality. The term quality generally refers to any attribute, service, or performance that is highly valued within a group or a community. Defining quality is thus context-dependent, field-specific, and subject to individual preferences and tastes. It is important to note, however, that compared to other cultural products such as music and paintings, 
journalistic content is unique because it has a strong civic and democratic component. The idea of the press as the fourth estate stems from the expectation that high-quality journalism promotes democratic ideals by playing the role of a watchdog providing a public forum and serving as a reliable information provider. Therefore, when discussing news quality, normative aspects cannot be overemphasized. One thing that managers have to keep in mind is that they should mend fences after any fight. Opponents are not necessarily enemies. An opponent disagrees with you on the issue, of course, but enemies are ones with whom you also have a negative relationship. That makes it personal. You can often work with opponents and strategize toward mutually successful outcomes, but enemies are far more difficult and consequently far more dangerous. Try to keep opponents from becoming enemies and work to turn enemies into mere opponents. Find points of agreement and find ways you can legitimately support those who were your opponents. The subject of the fight will eventually recede, but you still need the relationships. Political decisions and management decisions about how much of any given species can be harvested are often based on the amount of money there is to be made. Profit leads to economic growth, which is the goal of many politicians and business leaders. But the problem with seeking continuous economic growth is that our economy is not separate from our environment. Everything in our economy comes from our environment. We extract resources from the world around us, consume them as products we eat or use, and then dump the waste back into the earth. Our earth is a finite ecosystem, which means there is only so much that we can take from the natural world to feed our economy, and only so much waste that the earth can absorb, before natural processes stop functioning properly. The constant effort to extract more and more resources is actually an ecological impossibility over the long term. Our survival depends on learning to live within the limits of ecosystems. There are no black and white issues in life, no categorical answers. Everything is a subject for endless debate and compromise. This is one of the core principles of our current society. Because that core principle is wrong, the society ends up causing a lot of problems when it comes to sustainability. There are some issues that are black and white. There are indeed planetary and societal boundaries that must not be crossed. For instance, we think our societies can be a little bit more or a little bit less sustainable. But in the long run, you cannot be a little bit sustainable. Either you are sustainable or you are unsustainable. It is like walking on thin ice. Either it carries your weight or it does not. Either you make it to the shore or you fall into the deep, dark, cold waters. And if that should happen to us, there will not be any nearby planet coming to our rescue. We are completely on our own. The modern corporation as a child of laissez-faire economics and of the market society is based on a creed whose greatest weakness is the inability to see the need for status and function of the individual in society. In the philosophy of the market society, there is no other social criterion than economic reward. Henry Maine's famous epigram that the course of modern history has been from status to contract neatly summarizes the belief of the 19th century that social status and function should be exclusively the result of economic advancement. This emphasis was the result of a rebellion against a concept of society which defined human position exclusively in terms of politically determined status and which thus denied equality of opportunity. But the rebellion went too far. In order to establish justice, it denied meaning and fulfillment to those who cannot advance, that is to the majority, instead of realizing that the good society must give both justice and status. The notion of a circular economy in which materials circulate continuously, being used and reused time and time again, is an appealing vision. However, it is crucial to highlight just how far we are from that goal at present. Although most textiles are entirely recyclable, 73% of waste clothing was incinerated or went to landfills globally in 2015. Just 12% was recycled into low-value textile applications such as mattress stuffing and less than 1% was recycled back into clothing. Some would question how realistic the idea of closing the loop can be. The complexity of the fashion system means that there are multiple opportunities for materials to leak from the reuse cycle. Furthermore, it must be noted that fiber recycling is not without its own environmental footprint. 
Even the reuse of second-hand clothing has implications in terms of resource use and waste, particularly if items are transported over long distances, dry cleaned and repackaged. When anticipating the effects of time, we should mentally forecast what they are likely to be. We should not practically stop them from happening by demanding the immediate performance of promises which time alone can fulfill. The man who makes his demand will find out that there is no worse or stricter usurer than time, and that if you compel time to give money in advance, you will have to pay a rate of interest much higher than any usurer would require. It is possible, for instance, to make a tree burst forth into leaf, blossom, or even bear fruit within a few days by the application of unslaked lime and artificial heat, but after that the tree will wither away. So a young man may abuse his strength, it may be only for a few weeks, by trying to do at 19 what he could easily manage at 30, and time may give him the loan for which he asks. But the interest he will have to pay comes out of the strength of his later years, Indeed, it is part of his very life itself. There are disturbing changes underway in today's school systems. Funding is frequently tied to scores achieved on standardized tests, which primarily evaluate rote memory. Teaching two tests like these inevitably focuses resources and curriculum on the lower scoring students. The pressure to bring up test scores for these struggling students limits time for the kinds of individualized learning that challenges all students to reach their highest potential and teachers have less opportunity to encourage creative thinking and incorporate hands-on activities. When education is not enriched by exploration, discovery, problem-solving, and creative thinking, students are not truly engaged in their own learning. Because teachers are required to emphasize uninspiring workbooks and drills, more and more students are developing negative feelings about mathematics, science, history, grammar, and writing. Opportunities to authentically learn and retain knowledge are being replaced by instruction that teaches to the tests. For many years, it was indeed widely believed that the adult brain was essentially set, with all the neurons and major connections we'd need. Sure, we learn new things and update our understanding of things all the time, meaning new connections are regularly being formed and turned over in networks governing learning and memory. But in terms of overall physical structure and major connections, the stuff that makes us what we are, the adult brain was long thought to be done. However, in recent years there's been a steady stream of evidence revealing that the adult brain can change and adapt, even create new neurons, and experiences can still reshape the brain, even as we head into our twilight years. Consider the taxi driver study, where constant driving and navigation of chaotic London streets leads to increased hippocampus size, revealing the adult brain structure is somewhat malleable, Often, ideological principles crystallize in laws, rules and institutions that threaten to block deals. Nationalism requires that all resources belong to the state and that no one else may own them. Islamic fundamentalism prohibits interest payments on loans. Egyptian socialism demands that workers participate both in the management and the profits of an enterprise. Each of these principles can be an obstacle to deal-making in particular cases, yet, with some creativity, it is possible to structure a deal in such a way that the ideological principle is respected, but business goes forward. For example, worker participation in management need not mean a seat on the company's board of directors, but simply an advisory committee that meets regularly with an officer of the company. And a petroleum development contract could be written in such a way that the ownership of oil is transferred, not when the oil is in the ground, but at the point that it leaves the flange of the well. The unquestioned assumption that any and all scientific knowledge and associated technology contributes to sustainability derives from faith in the importance of objective knowledge for solving global problems. Scientists obtain power and become the priests of our era to the extent that they provide a special form of knowledge that can be used to do such wonderful things. And we often consider that the final test of scientific knowledge we can do things with its results, such as applying it to reverse the decline of an endangered species. Regardless, we know now that the linear view of the relation between science and social outcomes is flawed. Science may allow us to do things, but we can assess its contribution to sustainability only by incorporating broader contextual and socio-ecological questions. We typically think of sustainability as doing something out there in the world, when in fact we may need to first reassess the way we are setting the problem. According to research from the University of Arizona's Bureau of Applied Research in Anthropology, 
the average household ends up wasting an average of 14% of its grocery spending by throwing away unused or spoiled food. Even worse, 15% of that waste includes products that were never opened and were still within their expiration date. The study also found that a family of four ends up throwing away an average of $590 of perishable groceries per year, such as meat, produce, dairy, and grain products. You can save an average of $50 per month by avoiding overbuying perishable foods. Check your supplies before shopping and estimate the exact amount you'll need to buy for the next week. This is also a good time to throw away outdated leftovers, make sure perishable items are in view, and use up good leftovers for that day's meals. Throughout history, human imagination has been a double-edged sword. On one hand, it pushes new discoveries, but for every newly established scientific fact, there are often multiple incorrect hypotheses, which must be corrected along the way or risk becoming myths. Thomas Edison is credited with saying, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work, implying that error is part of invention. Unfortunately, if errors or partial truths get circulated long enough, they can lead to a false echo chamber of repetition and suggest truth where none exists. For example, even though the humors have been discredited for centuries, some still believe in the myth that blood types, blood being one of the four humors, can determine personalities. A quick internet search finds more than 5 million websites related to this topic, meaning this myth is slow to die. Ideally, when we make art or engage in any creative activity by ourselves, we recognize its value and make time and space for it in our lives. The boom in coloring books and coloring pages in the past few years is one such example. It takes away the challenging part of visual art making and skills and provides us with a level of challenge that is relatively easy and manageable. Our studies with cancer patients and caregivers showed solitary activities like coloring helped in meditative and reflective ways by taking us to a space of distraction away from everyday concerns. Such activities do not necessarily help us resolve our problems, rather, they provide a time to rest and a way to focus our attention elsewhere until such time as we can address them directly. When we make art by ourselves, it can help us self-regulate, feel a sense of mastery, control and agency over our lives, and engage in reflective, validating, contemplative or meditative practices. When Galileo rolled the balls down the inclined plane, he didn't merely look and see what happened, he very carefully measured the distance traveled and the time it took to travel that distance. From these measurements, he calculated the speed of travel. What he came up with was a mathematical equation relating numerical quantities. We can imagine that when he observed the moons of Jupiter, he didn't merely see some spots at various different places from night to night. He kept track of where the spots were, compared their positions from night to night, and perhaps did some calculations intended to compute what path they were traveling, to find out that their change in apparent position was consistent with there being bodies moving around Jupiter. Similarly, in my hypothetical bird experiment, I imagined myself as a budding junior scientist weighing the stuff I put into the cage and calculating percentages by weight of what was eaten. It's obvious. Numbers are important to science. Scientists measure and calculate. They don't just observe.